It's good to greet each of you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. A friend of mine who was a minister at the home church for a few years always greeted the crowd on Sunday morning like that, and I thought, well, that's a pretty good greeting. I do appreciate this opportunity to spend some time with you in God's Word and what it means for each of us. I should mention that there's been some sadness in our family because my sister-in-law, Peggy, passed away here just a few weeks ago, and now, um, and many of you prayed for Lainey, Lainey Gould, and she was special needs. Uh, she was nine and a half years old, but she died Friday night uh, in the Kansas City Mercy uh, Children's Hospital. So. I uh, have appreciated uh, your prayers on her behalf, but she had a lot of uh, respiratory issues, as uh, many times is the case, and so um, she did pass, and her services on Tuesday, which fits in a little bit with uh, today and where we're at. Uh, today, we kind of begin the week that's a Memorial Day week that ends with Memorial Day on uh, the 30th. And uh, that's a time in which we remember. And so this morning, I've entitled this, How Will You Be Remembered? And um, we have a couple scriptures that we're going to read together, and then we'll begin to uh, break this down. Paul, Paul's la probably his last letter was Second Timothy. And uh, it's one you ought to read, it's short, so you can read it in just a few minutes, but you really see some emotion and the pouring out of his heart in that second uh, letter. And he says here, and he's reflecting on uh, Timothy. He said, I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly Remember you in my prayers. Now he's talking to Timothy. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. And I'm reminded of the sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in there. Verse 5 would make a tremendous sermon in itself. So Paul is relating to the younger man, the evangelist, Timothy, that he had trained, and uh, he, he has great emotion, and Timothy has great emotion towards his mentor, Paul. And then the other one is one that I always use any time I've done a funeral service. Revelation 14, 13. And I heard a voice from heaven say, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor and their deeds will follow them. May 30th, 1868 would have been the first Memorial Day celebration at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. About a few of you have been to Arlington. I have. It's a moving experience. Tomb of the Unknown Soldiers there. A lot of other things. Actually, it's Robert E. Lee's farm <laughs> that they took and made the cemetery, I believe. But anyway, beside the point. James Garfield, who also was a member of the Church of Christ, who became the president of uh, a college out in Ohio that uh, trained ministers. And uh, he was a Civil War general. And his whole story is fascinating because they've just written a book a few years ago about him, and he shouldn't have died. But due to the fact the germ theory was not known by too many people, they were very poor in their cleanliness, and he died as a result of carelessness by a bunch of uh, medical people. James Garfield addressed 5,000 people. That's quite a crowd at Arlington. And after his address... They went and decorated 20,000 graves of Union and Confederate soldiers. Thus, the tradition of Memorial Day 
began. And I found that to be very, rather fascinating myself, just to think of 5,000 people in those days, no PA system, incidentally, and uh, then 20,000 graves. I can't even imagine that uh, Joyce and I went and decorated my mom and dad's gra grave up in Baird, and uh, uh, my goodness sake, I don't know how many is in Highland Cemetery, but there is certainly nothing there close, and yet people decorated both Union and Confederate graves. So that's the tradition that we have today, and, and it's one that's important, but it's wrapped up in this idea of remembering. And so my question to you this morning, on this Sunday morning here in this congregation, a bright sunny day, at least so far, we've had a lot of ups and downs in the weather, how will you be remembered? And I want us to think about that as we uh, go along here, because um, Time will come for all of us when we will end our journey. I know it's not real popular to talk about death, but we need to talk about death, especially on Memorial Day, uh, soon to be Memorial Day weekend. And I just hope we can be instructive as Christian people. If you profess to be a follower of Jesus Christ, then uh, you ought to be concerned about what kind of a witness you currently are, how you will be remembered. Of course, we all have to realize that not everybody will remember us favorably for a variety of reasons, but to the best of your ability, we need to set an example as what a Christ follower really is and uh, leave a legacy. My uh, sister sat down with her grandchildren before she died and just explained to them what she believed. And I'm hopeful that that uh, was helpful to her grandkids. Five people that I went to college with um, either, well shortly thereafter, have gone to their reward. Young 20 year old people training for ministry, gone. Now Eileen didn't pass away, but Eileen came to the college from another college and I found out her story. Her story was two weeks before her wedding day, a young man that was going to be a preacher was killed in a car accident. Well, Eileen came to our college and she met somebody and she uh, married uh, later and uh, was a preacher's wife as far as I know. But it was a tragic thing for uh, somebody in their 20s to have to deal with your fiance is dead. Ed was uh, a guy who graduated and him and his wife Linda went to, uh, I believe it was Brazil, and he was riding a motorcycle because over there in those places, that's a good way to get around, a cheap way to get around, uh, evidently not a safe way to get around. He, he was hit, and he was killed. And uh, Mike was probably the most spiritual guy I've ever met. Mike was from Iowa. Mike took me to church the first Sunday I was at college. And um, he could play the guitar. He could play basketball. He could teach. Uh, but he was the most humble guy I ever met. You see, his dad and sister were killed in a small plane crash. And his mother almost lost her life, but she lived. And it was, it was a year after uh, we moved up here. I was listening to the news and they talked about a small plane crash in, southern, in um, central Missouri. And I thought I heard it right, but I called the TV station. This is eons ago. <laughs> and they said, yes, that's the right name. His plane went down and Mike was killed in a plane crash. He was so affected with young people. He would take them deeper in the faith. And uh, so you find yourself... Um, Asking the question that uh, Jason was kind of talking about here. Uh, just don't understand that, do we? These are young people in their 20s training to, for ministry. Uh, they're gone. Now, God has a purpose, and we believe that. Dan was the only, was the other one. Dan, uh, his dad was in charge of the grounds at the college. And uh, after he graduated, he went on to seminary because he wanted to be an Air Force chaplain. And they have some requirements. And Dan was uh, an Air Force chaplain. And he was somewhere when somebody was drowning, Dan swam out to save them and drowned himself. 
So, you know, that's just from my experience, people that I know. I've thought about that over the years quite a bit, and I don't understand all of that. But, uh, again, life is short. And, of course, the work that I do now, I, I work and live among death, and I see it every day. And life is but a vapor. And we need to understand that. But as Christian people, because Jesus was resurrected from the dead, we don't have to fear death. Because we will be resurrected someday. And we will go to be with him if we have been a follower of Jesus Christ who has been faithful in the way we've lived our life. Just very quickly, I, I'm asked frequently about this, and I hear lots of things at the hospital about what happens when you die from all kinds of people, and I just wonder, where did they get some of that? So I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. Now, this is not a sequential thing that this happens and this happens and this happens. I'm just telling you some of the scriptures that give us some hints about what will happen and I believe that's by God's design because we're living by faith and he's not going to pour out the whole picture of what happens the time you draw your last breath but he gives some indication and so I have these here and again when you study any kind of issue in the Bible you want to make sure you gather all the scripture that you possibly know and then you read them and you try to figure out what they're saying in their proper context and then you formulate what you believe. That should be done all of the time. Well this is about death. First of all it's pretty clear that the soul separates from the body. The soul is that inner real you person. This whole body that I have, that you have, is wearing out. But the soul is eternal. It's who you really are. And scripture teaches that that's what happens. The soul separates from the body. That's why that body that you see at the funeral home is just, it's gone. But the soul lives on. So I hope you find some joy in that. Secondly, uh, now let me, you, you go to the presence of God. Now, this is where it gets a little bit fuzzy. Some would say there's an intermediate state of the dead, and there could be. Others would say, no, when you die, you go to be with Jesus. Thirdly, you'll have a glorified body. If you haven't figured it out, the body that I have, that you have, is not compatible with heaven. You need a new one. And so you get a new body. And uh, the old one's worn out. And you go to meet the Lord in the air. Yes, there is a going up. There is a rapture. Now, I'm not so sure it's a secret rapture, but if you think it's a secret rapture, that's fine. My chaplain friend said, now, if you ever come in here and see my shoes there, that means the rapture has taken me. <laughs> I said, okay, Bob, uh, I'll, uh, I'll do that. And you will meet the Lord in the air, as we have stated, and then there's judgment, and that's uh, one of the things that's dis uh, discussed quite a bit. Judgment, that sounds awful. Well, it'll be awful for the one who hasn't been faithful to Jesus. But it should be glorious for the Christian. You're, you're vindicated. Some would even say there are rewards, and that's a whole other thing. And again, it won't be a dreaded event if we are standing that judgment. It'll be for your reward your vindication. So that's just a little bit. The Bible says, inasmuch as it is appointed for man to die once, and then comes the judgment, Hebrews 9.27. So I just wanted to ask you some questions here this morning, and I'll try to make this quick. That might quickly, do it quickly, I guess, would be. Number one, so as, as, as we're trying to build a legacy here, okay, here's a question to consider. Will I be remembered as one who had a thirst for God? Now, these are for you to answer. I'm not going to say what I think of you in any shape or form, but it, let, ask yourself that question. It's a good uh, question when your feet hit the floor when you get up in the morning. Do I have a thirst for God? Psalm uh, 42, verse 1, As the deer pants for the streams of living water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. Uh, a simile, I think, is what it is, comparison. The deer is looking for the stream, and you should be looking for the waters that uh, are about God. Sin will get in the way of your seeking of God, and so you need to be aware of that. So will you be known as one who has a thirst for God? And, of course, 
I, we want to be like Paul in Philippians 3.10 when he says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and uh, I want to know Jesus better. Now, that's really what life is to be about is getting to know people better. You get married and you 10 years down the line, you're still learning about your spouse, 20, 30, 40. <laughs> I see some head shaking. Um, isn't that the way it should be with God, that we're always seeking to learn more about what he wants us to be? Uh, you know, what are you, what are you interested in? That'll tell you a lot about your spiritual uh, nature. What occupies your time? Uh, what drives you? Those are things that affect you're thirsting for God. Augustine said, my soul is restless until I find rest in you, O Lord. Second question. Will you be known as a loving person? 1 John 4, 7 says, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. Basic to Christian teaching is what Jesus said when he was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. On another occasion, a lawyer examined him and said, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said the same thing. But then the man wanting to justify himself said, and who is my neighbor? That's what carrying hands is all about. Our neighbor. That's the question. So he tells a story, the most famous Bible story there is, the parable of the Good Samaritan. A Samaritan? Now you, you need to study a little bit and find out the Jews and the Samaritans were... Not like this. They were like this. So you think of the people group that we would be the least likely to be interested in, friending them. That's what we're talking about. And so Jesus simply says anybody of any stripe, of any ethnic group, of any nationality, and I didn't say it like that, but I'm interpreting it for you, it has a need we need to be there. And I would agree with our uh, brother here that talked to us earlier. It, this COVID thing, for me personally, has taught me there are hungry people in this area that we, the church, need to feed. I guess I had my colored glasses on. We live in and around Des Moines, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of hungry people, and I didn't realize it. I should have because I was around when Caring Hands began and even had a little bit of uh, input into that. And uh, I guess I'm just, it takes me a while to learn things maybe. So will you be known as a loving person is a, is a critical issue here because you read the book of First John and John tells us that if you don't love people or if you hate people, you're a murderer. And he says, you know what happens to a murderer. You can read the scripture. I won't take too much time with that because our time is fleeing. But that is a key thing. And I'm telling you, I'm disappointed in the response by many Christian people about their neighbor in the last year and a half. We have an obligation, whoever your neighbor is, to do something in the name of Jesus for them and not overlook that. Thirdly, will you be known who, is, who has been governed by the word of God, the Bible? Is that how people re remember you? 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is breathed of God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or woman of God could be thoroughly equipped, furnished in every good work. The Bible teaching we ought to be concerned about. The Bible will rebuke us. It'll convict the sinner. It'll correct us. Sometimes we need correcting. The Bible will do that if you're reading it and if you're listening to what others teach it. 
and training, raising kids, instructing, whatever the case may be. And uh, we just need to understand. Sometimes we fail to realize that uh, people's hearts are hardened because of sin. So prayer is what we need to exercise so that that hard heart can be penetrated by the Word of God. So if it gets soft enough and that Word of God is being read or heard or studied, it'll penetrate that heart. And people can come to know Christ as their, as one old evangelist called it, your personal Savior. The Bible doesn't use that terminology, but it's all right. So I hope that you can understand that, uh, that the, the, the Bible ha- is powerful. Uh, James would say that uh, don't just listen, do what it says. <laughs> James 1.22, uh, 1 Peter 1.21, Peter says that we're born again by the living word of God. Somebody has said this book, the Bible, will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this Bible. Question number four, will you be known as one who's concerned about the church and the kingdom of God? And what we heard this morning about carrying hands is part of the kingdom of God. This church is part of the kingdom of God. Churches that believe uh, the scripture and preach Jesus, uh, whatever the case may be. You know, this verse is usually, in fact, I used it at about every wedding ceremony. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Great statement, great instruction but I'm going to use it for the fact that Jesus loved the church. And I'll admit my sin to you this morning. I've been very critical of the church on many occasions. And I'm trying to change my, my attitude and mind, but it's only because of my disappointment in what Christian people do in the name of the church, or don't do the sin of commission and the sin of omission. And so I need to understand, it's still the church that Jesus died for, and Jesus loved the church, but it is pitiful at times, folks. The church is pitiful, and we ought to be concerned about kingdom work and leading people to Jesus Christ. And are we concerned about what's outside of these walls? Too many times we're doing all the things inside the walls. Get outside of the walls and let people know that God loves them and uh, he wants them to come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And will you be known as a person, number five, who is able to forgive others. Now, I'll be the first to say that's not an easy thing to do. But if you're a Christian, we have to chip away at it if we've got forgiveness issues that we're not letting go of. We need to take them to God. We need to pray over them ourselves. We need to read Scripture. We need to seek the advice of others because forgiveness is exactly what Satan wants to block our relationship with God is the lack of forgiveness. Corey Ten Boom, if you have never read her story, this has been years ago, her family housed Jews during World War II when Holland was invaded by the Germans and finally were found out and they were imprisoned in those horrible prison camps. In prison camp, uh, uh, Corey lost Betsy, her sister, and her dad, Uh, because of that experience, she got out only on a clerical error. They let her go. There was some mistake that was made, and she was let go, and she spent her time roaming the war-torn Europe and telling people about Jesus Christ. One night, though, she was shocked deeply when she saw this man in the crowd, and then he came up to her, making it even worse, And he said, do you remember me? Because I remember you. It was a guard at the camp where she lost her sister and her dad. And he said, 
will you forgive me? That's about as difficult a scenario as I could think of. And she said, uh, it was hard, but she said, yes, I, I can forgive you. And then lastly, will you be remembered as one who looked forward to heaven? I've told you about my preaching professor, Don DeWelt, who, if you saw him on campus and you said, good morning, Brother DeWelt, how are you? He would say, I'm happy and I'm on my way to heaven. Now, that wouldn't be the answer many people would feel comfortable giving, but he just radiated that. And I tell you what, that uh, caused a lot of people to think a little bit. But, you know, we should be, because Paul talks about that. He said, I, I want to do this work here, but I want to go to be with the Lord. And so this morning, as we think about how will you be remembered, I hope these questions will kind of perk your thinking just a little bit and ask yourself, uh, what am I leaving for those who know me? And don't be hard on yourself, just be motivating to yourself and think, you know, I need to do a better job. I want people to see an adequate witness for Christ. That's, see, we make this thing about sharing Christ harder than it needs to be. We just need to live differently as a Christian person where you work, where you live, in your neighborhood, in your church. Just be what you believe Jesus wants you to be. Let me close with a story. This is about death because we've been talking about being remembered after we die and we're moving into Memorial Day week. And this is a great story. Catherine Marshall was the wife of Peter Marshall. Now, you got to be old school to even know who we're talking about, but you, you need to... A book, Catherine Marshall wrote some great books. Peter Marshall was a great preacher. And he, there's, some, there's even a movie, A Man Called Peter. You ought to get it. Get your Netflix out and dig around and find it. It's a great story. He was the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. Uh, but at any rate, she tells this story. This is a, a story. I don't know if this is true. It could be true. But she said, uh, she told this Little uh, Kenneth was a terminally ill child who was not bedfast but was dying. And uh, Kenneth asked his mother one time um, about death. What was it like and uh, would it hurt? And mother said, you know, Kenneth, she said, when you were a tiny boy, you'd play all day long and you'd be so tired that you'd, you'd come into our room and we couldn't even get your clothes, your pajamas on because you were so tired and you just flopped in our bed and went to sleep. And she said the next morning, you woke up in your own bed. Well, how did you get there? Well, your daddy took, him, took, him, took you in his arms and moved you over to your own bed. You weren't supposed to be in our bed. You were supposed to be in your bed. And she said, death is kind of like that. That uh, someday, someday you, you're here, but someday you'll be taken to the right place by Jesus. And he looked at her and uh, he understood. Sad to say, some months later he died. And I don't know how you look at death. It's something that we all know about, hear about, think about at some time. But if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, you have the hope of eternal life. And uh, while you're here on this earth, make the most of it and enjoy your Christian faith. I see too many people that aren't enjoying their Christian faith. Enjoy being a follower of Jesus Christ. And when that time comes, just be assured of the fact that God is going to take care of you.